Okay, welcome to today's podcast radio episode, The Ty Lopez Show. I've got a special guest. I ran into his book uh, somewhere in my all my book collecting, The Evolution of Beauty, Richard Prum, and he was gracious enough to join us. We're going to be talking about a very interesting subject. So one of the most common questions, I've tweeted about this, and he always gets people riled up, is should you date and marry for beauty? for looks or for personality. And I've read your book one and a half times. And so he, uh, Richard has a very interesting take on this. Now, Dr. David Buss has been on my show a few times and um, he is more of a classic evolutionary psychologist and you have somewhat of a disruptive conversation. So by the way, my grandma went to Yale. So by the way, uh, <laughs> Richard is a professor at Yale. You do what? Is it the ornithology? No, yeah, no I'm a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology, but uh, really I'm a, I'm a ornithologist, which is a bird guy. Bird guy. And if you know anything about evolution, a lot of it, uh, Darwin talked a lot about, you know, the, the, the peacock's plume and all this kind of stuff. So birds played a big role in us understanding. So I want to jump right into it, even before we go live here. Um, why is it so hard for people to accept theories of beauty? Like you talk about in your book, you're not the most popular person with this theory. Is it because not many people are pretty? And so no one likes to hear a theory <laughs> that being pretty is important. No, I, I, I think what really happens is that people are uh, freaked out by, uh, by scientific solutions that uh, are, if you will, off the ranch. You know, most people believe that, uh, in evolutionary biology, believe that adaptation is a strong force. You know, right. natural selection is a strong force that dictates uh, the important outcomes in, in evolution. Um, and people want that powerful idea to be true. And so um, they try to reconstruct beauty in a way that conforms to that idea. And and I'm I'm uh, and I think Darwin are telling a really different story. And uh, and that's why that's why uh, people don't want to hear it. Yeah. And so basically, for those listening, and, and you should obviously summarize this. But what I took away, and we'll talk about this a few times, especially when we go live. But you know, the classic theory is that everything in evolution has a specific purpose. People, female or males, they mate because this one's stronger, will bring more food to the table. And your book basically says, yes, there's some truth to that, but some of it is just pure, unexplainable attractiveness that attracts things sometimes. Is that yeah. is that a poor boy explanation? Yeah. Well, we're getting there. I mean, really, the idea is... Um, I really think that beauty is uh, can be can function like an irrationally exuberant market bubble, mm. right? It can evolve and detach value uh, away from its uh, some kind of objective standard, right? And uh, it happens in economics. Why not in nature? Right. Uh, and uh, and 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 this is uh, this is a, a, a kind of powerful uh, and kind of disruptive idea that beauty could evolve for its own sake. Yeah, the war. I, I just saw a movie. It was uh, what was it? The Roses War, War of the Roses. It wasn't War of the Roses, but it's a new one. It actually flopped. It's an indie, and it's about back several hundred years ago in Netherlands. There was this big tulip. It was a tulip war. I think that's what yeah. the movie's called. And you know, it's actually a Weinstein movie, which we all know Weinstein's <laughs> in the news a lot right now. I just yeah. How does that factor into the evolution? That's not or, factored in. <laughs> um, beauty. But, you know, there was an exuberance where people were literally becoming millionaires by investing in tulips. And, and then it crashed. And it, it's a very similar to 2008 and 1929 and 1987. So, Absolutely. so and, is and, that and, kind of what you're talking about, the exuberance? Yeah, and, 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 and I think it's not an accident that the first market bubble, which you described, was about something that's beautiful. Right. The whole idea of the tulip bulb is that it's beauty. Right. It's beauty in a plant that people want to collect and grow in their house and expand the beauty of their lives. So, I mean, the fact that it's beautiful really contributed to the idea that it could be totally irrational and unstable and crash. Uh, and I think that's a property of uh, biological marketplaces, too. They're just sexual marketplaces. Right. 
and you know it, it it's funny with beauty i think that um and what i want to get into this a little bit is like defining beauty and also in a, a little bit later talking about what's the implications like what what is it your book the evolution of beauty how darwin's forgotten theory of mate choice shapes us uh shapes the animal world and us like what's the takeaways but before we get to that because i want to do that when we're live Absolutely. what is an example you talk about an example of ducks and i thought this was pretty interesting actually i want to go let's go live with this because people are going to find this interesting all right so i'm going to do a little give me one minute i'm going to do a little separate intro can I, should I just call you Professor Prum? Do you go by no, that? Call me, call me uh, Rick. Okay. <laughs> Professor Rick. I like that. No, just Rick. <laughs> <laughs> just Professor Rick. Rick, it sounds good. Yeah, Professor Prum, but just go with Rick. And that, that, okay. That's a stable. Uh, that's a survival. Okay. And I'm going to put, oh, I think you spelled, you spelled prof there. That's one F, two S's. Sorry. Here too. One thing that I was just wondering, how in the world did you even stumble upon this? Uh, would this be in the beauty of birds or? Uh... No, 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 no. That, that beauty, you have a disruptive theory in evolution. Was that, did you? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a bird nut. I started at about the age of 10 and I never considered doing anything else in the world, right? And I'm, I'm uh, you know, now I'm uh, 45 years into this whole thing, the study of beauty of birds. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, you spend that amount of time, that amount of focus, and um, you learn a thing. And that's that's where I'm at. So basically the love of birds led to the discovery how important beauty was among birds and then and humans. And, you know, uh, I never, you know, and, and uh, yeah, decades of, uh, of, of, uh, of scientific study. Good. All right, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do a... I do some giveaways during this, so I'm going to announce them at here at the beginning. I'm going to hold this book up. All right, so everybody smile. We're going to get a thumbnail for YouTube first. Ready? Here we go. All right, we got our thumbnail. So we'll go live very fast on all four of them. One, two, three, and four. What is up, everybody? I'm going live. I'm actually here live on four different places. YouTube. We're talking about the beauty of humans and what it means, what it means for sexuality, what it means for you, what it means for dating life. Stay to the end. We're here, by the way, with uh, Professor Rick Prum. He doesn't like to be called Professor, but we're going to we'll call him that. He's a professor at Yale. And basically, I want to talk about why beauty is important and what he found, because it's very interesting. We think of beauty as not very important. Let me get you Instagram going here. Ugh. Instagram, what's up Instagram? Always one of these is having a problem. But one of the questions, you know, is beauty skin deep? Is Does personality matter in dating? These are huge questions that people have. Are you in the right connection? Yeah. For sure? Huh, Instagram's usually the most stable of all. So we'll be taking questions, someone says, Mark Benny Pio says you should just date whoever is compatible with you. David Smith says personality is better, but beauty is okay for me. Beauty rots, personality doesn't. That's pretty interesting take. But if you, this is a great book, by the way. I've read it 1.5 times. Yeah, just go. It already has a three, two, one counter. There we go. Here, now we got Instagram. This is the big one. What's up, Instagram? I'm giving away cash. Giving away iPhone 7 at the end, so pay attention. I'm here with Professor Rick Prum. We're talking about his book, The Evolution of Beauty. He's a professor at Yale, and he has a controversial theory about how important beauty is. We forget about this. So I'm going to be asking questions throughout. This is for my live podcast. And so just call you Rick. He likes to be called Rick. He's a humble guy. So what are your book talks all about this. We were just talking about this on my podcast, about how important beauty the role beauty plays even if we can't figure out the purpose of beauty that beauty is important if you watch tv if you look at instagram posts beautiful people are getting more uh likes you look at girls on instagram you have you know these girls have 15 million followers and they're being followed not necessarily because of personality it might be personality but they definitely are above average beauty 
before we get into the science of this, what's the practical implications of your book for somebody watching The Evolution of Beauty? Do we just all get depressed and go, if you're not super beautiful, you're not going to mate, uh, you're not going to find love? Like, what do we need to know here? Yeah, well, I think the the the, the lesson from my book is that uh, you know beauty is a social contrivance. It's it's invented by people, by us, okay. by groups of people. And what that means is, uh, you know, humans in particular um, uh, have the evolved capacity to find uh, themselves and other people beautiful. And not only that. Uh, that we're especially evolved in order uh, uh, to be to be satisfied, to find uh, long-lasting uh, and 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 satisfying uh, relationships. So so uh, I think uh, the the message of the book is really uh, is really optimistic for people. So one of the things in your book you're talking about, you're a bird specialist, ornithologist. Absolutely. Love birds since you were ten years old. This is kind of how you stumbled upon this theory. Now. The devil's advocate or people on the other side of the scale that are more classical evolutionary psychologists, they say, no, everything we find beautiful is functional. For example, in general, throughout all cultures, men like women with a certain relatively similar hip to waist ratio. You talk about in the book, if you go to Samoa, women are, you know, a lot bigger because they've what they find beautiful is bigger than, let's say, in Japan. Uh, but someone like Dr. Buss has found that the ratios still say somewhat similar. It's just, you know, it's a ratio. So if the butt is bigger, people still, for example, all like the butt to be bigger, the hips, than the waist. Nobody goes, oh, I met this girl with a flat butt and a huge belly, and that's attractive. So, and the reason that scientists give, other scientists, is that, for example, fertility can be predicted based on this hip to uh, waist ratio. So do you agree with that? Are you challenging that? So, you know, I spent most of my career uh, working on birds and uh, in great detail. And the, the work I'm doing in the book on people is new. But I mean, really to clarify what the idea is that people think that beauty in nature, whether it's a bird of paradise or a human, is like a biological match.com profile full right. of information that mates need to know about about that that prospective other mate. You know, who are his people? Does he come from a good egg? Uh, does he have uh, money in the bank? Uh, what is he eating? You know, does he have a good diet? Uh, does he smoke? Or even what is he smoking, right? These are the things that mates uh, <laughs> want to know, right? right? Does he have sexually transmitted diseases, right? right. And so, so, so what that means is that every detail of ornament in nature is supposed to be a kind of um, a kind of uh, 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 of actionable intelligence, right. right? It's really it's really about detail. Now, the other possibility is that it's uh, merely beautiful, as I would say, that it's attractive for its own sake, right? right. And and the and, and and the difference between those two ideas is that one is about adaptation, right? If 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 mates are actually better, if you if the things you prefer are actually better, that means that that mating and, and beauty are just another example of adaptation, right? But if, uh, but if, uh, if, 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 if beauty is merely attractive, that means something distinct. That means that there's other forces in, in evolutionary biology than, than, the, than, uh, than adaptation. And that's an interesting uh, conundrum. So uh, to people, yes, uh, you know, uh, Buss and I would disagree about almost everything, in fact, um, <laughs> and, and I, I would, I would, I would, I would, uh, you know, you could start with uh, with uh, waist hip ratio. You know, um, the evidence that that's actually associated it might be attractive to many people, and I don't deny there are some data to support that. But um, the idea that that's associated with uh, actually um, with uh, you know fertility or 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 or, uh, or fitness is actually pretty poor. In hmm. fact, a lot of the most beautiful, what are considered to be some of the most beautiful people in the world, uh, fashion models, many of them are so starved uh, that they are, uh, 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 you know, uh, essentially um, unfertile. Uh, right. Yet people find them to be totally attractive. Well, what's with that? 
if they were, why would you prefer a mate who uh, no longer menstruates or you know has no uh, eggs that are available for fertilization, right? So, so there's lots of ways in which people's actual conception of beauty is not about uh, about improving their their their, their fitness. Uh, and what uh, evolutionary psychologists and others uh, lack is a critical view of the idea of the importance of natural selection in in in, in human evolution or so, in evolution in general. So. One of the things that you talk about in the book, I, I took notes here that I thought was really interesting that I think people will like. You're talking about, and I, I kind of see this, this is towards the end of the book. Um, you said, we humans have evolved through a distinct evolutionary advance of female interests. So one of the things we think about is that men are the decide. I mean, not every, if you know more about the subject, you don't think, but the common person thinks, look, it's men that are determining who's beautiful. It's male. You hear a lot of this, you know, who Playboy magazine or Maxim magazine, they're determining what beauty is. But at the end of the day, it's really women who choose like our species. We humans are, it, it's men will sleep with anything is the basic easy way to say it, but women won't. It, even uh, Dr. Helen Fisher did some studies I thought was interesting on animals where they would bring an elephant. You know, there was a female elephant at the San Diego Zoo or something. And they'd bring a male elephant, which looked just like a male elephant to them. And they, they wanted to have, you know, little elephant babies. So they stuck the male, the male in the pen and the female ran to the other side. She found him unattractive. We couldn't see it, but there was something wrong with that male elephant. And so... By her, in effect, running the other way, she was determining that man's DNA or that male's DNA will not uh, continue throughout time. And so are you agreeing that it's really in society, it's women's view and, and women's choice that's determining much more, they're much more important than men? Yeah. Well, you know, you know, Ty, the, the uh, talking about human uh, uh, sexuality and the evolution of human sexuality is like the most complicated species there is. Right. right. And why is that? Because e women person, are complicated. No, no. You got you got male. You got male choice and female choice. You got a uh, 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 male male competition and female female competition. You also have uh, male coercion and female coercion. Mm -hmm. uh, giving rise to sexual conflict of various kinds. And then on top of that, you have culture, right? Uh, and, and so what that means is we're, we are the most complicated species there is. So it's, it's no wonder we can get our thoughts uh, mixed up or unclear about this, right? So um, I think, you know, that both male choice and female choice are happening actually real time in people. The question is, how do we get to be the way we are right now? And what I argue in the book is that is that the decisive feature, the decisive force that made humans uh, distinct from gorillas and chimpanzees, that gave us all of our real differences from the rest of nature, is female mate choice. And, and, and you know, uh, the book is long. It takes uh, uh, 250 pages to deal with the birds. And that's only, you, only after that do you get started on, on the mammals and on the people, right? And so uh, understanding people, you know, it might be easier if we if we talked about uh, birds for 250 pages, but that's that maybe that's a that, but well, let's cut to the people. So what 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 makes us different from apes, right? Well, one of the things that we're really different about apes, if you look at female sexuality in apes and monkeys, uh, especially old world monkeys, your average female is in a totally tough situation. There's some male that is in charge of her and in charge of her sexuality. He basically runs the show, right? So he controls you know, uh, uh, who she has sex with, et cetera. And he's, and he, uh, and he's brutal about it. Right. So one of the things that happens in, in chimpanzees and, and gorillas and other apes, or other, uh, monkeys is that, uh, if a new guy takes over, right, what's he do? The first thing he does is go and murder all the babies. Right. From the, called, from that was from the infanticide or not infanticide, but what, what do you call and, it? And the, and, the, and the reason, the reason is because when females are lactating, when they're supporting a young baby offspring, right, they're, they're not, not fertile. And so, so, so he is in charge of the troop now or the group, and he doesn't have control over, uh, he can't expand his, 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 his fertility. How does he do that? He murders all the babies. 
right? And then and then and then and then the females come into uh, estrus, or they come in, they become fertile, and then he mates with them all, and then expands his own. So this has a huge impact on female lifetime success, right? Um, and you know, humans are unique in many ways, but all of them involve an expansion in childhood, right? Whether it's big brains, language, culture, material culture, all the things that make humans distinctive require longer childhoods in order to um, in order to, um, to to create them, and and so the question would be: under what conditions would females evolve to invest more in their offspring? If a big bunch of them are getting murdered all the time in random social violence, you know, as males battling it with each other, the answer is never. Right. So human evolution required a solution to the infanticide problem. And the question is, how does that arise? In the book, I propose really for the first time that the way in which it arose is that females preferred those males that were essentially de-weaponized. And all you got to do is look at, uh, at a single smile. Can you smile, Kai? Ty? You're going, <laughs> hey, hey, what are you showing? You are showing that you do not have fangs in your face. Right. You know, our immediate closest relatives, the chimpanzees and gorillas, the males have deadly weapons in their faces. Huh. Deadly weapons that humans lack, human males lack. Huh. Now, males, males are, uh, human males are responsible for basically almost all of the social violence in the world today, right? right? It's like 90% of murders are men, and about 70% yeah. of them are and, drunk. And, 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 the other, and the women that are probably responding to abuse, <laughs> which drives them to it in many cases. So, so, so the question is, uh, under what conditions will males give up their weapons? That's it's a big, what, huge. It's when they're question. forced because the women won't sleep with them unless they're nice. So that's kind of what the book, the book says. I propose, I propose that weapons get lost when they become unsexy. Ah, and the, okay. way, the way to de-weaponize the males to get them below the belt where it hurts. Yes. Right. And that this process was critical to the origin of the human species. Right. And all we got to do is look at a human smile to see it. We're all advertising the fact that we, we don't have any fangs. So if I want to if I want to get rid of a girl that I'm dating, can I put those fake vampire things in and then smile and be like, <laughs> I, will I don't bite know. You. And, you know, uh, uh, humans have culture too. culture evolved after this. And culture is a weird thing. I mean, look at the popularity of vampire films, et cetera. So uh, well, what, I don't know if somebody find that a, a turn on. <laughs> what? what? That, that, one so thing. basically, so, 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 you know, uh, uh, human males are responsible for lots of violence, but one of the things they don't do in at any level ever is murder babies for their own sexual advantage. Right. And, you know, in apes, this is the primary cause of the death of infants. Yeah. It's Although like, step infants, stepfathers are responsible for about a hundred times more abuse than real fathers. Yeah, but that's still, but that's still point oh 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 one percent of infant deaths. Right. In 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 infanticide in gorillas and chimpanzees is responsible for a third of all infant deaths. Huh. Thirty percent, thirty five percent. Right. That's that's a tremendous difference. And you know that's that's the biggest transformation between humans and apes. And I think it's responsible for how we got here. And I think what it means is basically that. Uh, uh, that female choice was a critical role. Now, another way to look at this is body size. It turns out that, you know, gorilla males are about twice the size of females. Chimpanzees are about 30% larger. Even bonobos, the famously uh, uh, peaceful and, uh, and overtly sexual, uh, you know, uh, uh, pygmy chimpanzees, bonobos, are about 20% uh, 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 bigger. But in humans, it's, human males are only 16% larger. Hmm. Right now, in in bonobos, it's a it's a, a female. It's a complete. There is no sexual conflict. They're completely peaceful. There's yeah. no conflict. Right. And and uh, and in in and 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 yet those bonobo males are larger in body size than females than than human females. So how do you get smaller? I think it's a it's it's body it's body size choice. You know, even right now we have mostly people uh, preferring to mate with people of similar size. Yeah, if you those, would this explain those, mus musicians? Because I read an int oh, I don't know if it, sorry. Yeah, go for it. I read an yeah, interesting. Yeah. Th uh, there's a book I forget what it's called, and it's basically, you know, a lot of I even saw some people commenting here on the live stream that 
women always like the biggest, strongest guy. But if you look at the heartthrobs, the people who get posters on, you know, 20 year old girl or 19 year old girl's walls, it's like Justin Bieber. Now, Justin Bieber is not a big guy. He's probably five foot eight, 140 pounds, 150, maybe 150. And he's a guy who, you know, sings with not a deep voice, really. So there, there's a lot of evidence to what you're saying that women don't just look at fierce guys. Now, some what Dr. Buss says, it's, or, it's, a, it's a bimodal. It's a Short term, they look for big guys. They want to settle with smaller guys. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of data showing, what, what, you know, uh, a, a strong correlation. There are always exceptions. But basically, there's a strong correlation between the size of people in any couple. You know, and and and, and that, that's it, the data are are very strong. Now, uh, you know, the outliers are are you know uh, are 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 interesting. But you know, Justin Bieber doesn't have any role in. Uh, I mean, he's a, a sort of an icon. Right. He has some cultural relationship, but he doesn't really play a role in anybody's uh, you know sexual choices, except for the small world of people that might be around him. Uh, but but uh, uh, you know. Um, there are variations, but that's the that there's there's strong support for that. So I, I I think that basically getting this the sexes to be more similar in body size and elimination of of uh, of uh, of, uh, of canine weapons and also uh, you know uh, uh, transformation of personality. Your average uh, male uh, ape is like a homicidal maniac waiting for his time, you know. And, uh, and, and, and human males are, 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 are bad in a lot of ways, but they're not like that. Right. And, and how did that transformation of even human personality uh, come about? Um, it, it, I think it came about through, through, uh, through female choice, through female mate choice. So practical tips. I don't know if you even go. Some, <clears throat> some people don't like to jump across the world to the practical tips. Are there practical tips a man. Let's start with men and then women. From your book, if you were, let's say today was your last day on planet Earth and you're leaving some advice to your kids, male and female, what do you what do you tell your son and what do you tell your daughter based on your life's work? Yeah, well, I got I got three I got three sons and um, and they have absorbed uh, uh, my uh, my views very well <laughs> over over a long amount of time. You know. Um, I think the uh, the idea that uh, that tough, but uh, the idea of machismo, tough uh, and and dominant as as the core of attraction, is is uh, deeply flawed and is actually kind of a recipe for unhappiness. Hmm. And and uh, and in and in fact, you know, uh, um, um, you know. Uh, you know, maleness. I think in the modern world has taken a real uh, a direction that leads uh, to uh, to to everyone being unhappy, right? And so I, I think uh, actually get in touch with what it means to be caring, uh, both uh, for your partner and for your offspring, uh, is is a, is is a recipe for everybody's happiness, whether you're male or female. And that uh, and that uh, you know stories to the contrary uh, are often uh, rooted supposedly rooted in evolutionary biology but i i think that's uh that science is just really bad and this is a the book is really about another way to look at evolution uh that is uh, i think really much more consistent with the facts and gives us a really different appreciation for ourselves what about for women what would you tell i don't know if you have a daughter but what would you tell your daughter i don't have a daughter <laughs> i wish <laughs> your niece uh, I, you know, I, I, I love kids. I would have kept going and going. That'd be, that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, up to me. I, hopefully I would, hopefully I would already have, uh, you know, uh, uh, 10, 20 years of relationship with her already. But, uh, you know, now, now, uh, uh, this mythical person, it's hard to know what I would deliver one little message, you know, but, uh, um, you know, I, uh, well, you know, the, the, the flip side is also true. I mean, the evolutionary psychology view is that sperm are, are, are cheap and eggs are expensive. So so uh, so males should be profligate, you know, and, and females should be coy. And, uh, you know, that may explain sea urchins pretty well, uh, but that doesn't explain humans much at all. And and uh, so I think a lot of human evolution, you know, if you look at if, if female mate choice 
uh, shape the human species. That means that female mate choice is uh, is an important thing, and and it's not just about the uh, uh, choice. It's a uh, it's about mating and remating, right? You know, evolutionary biology is uh, or, or human evolution has really been shaped by by female sexuality, and that means female pleasure and the female pursuit of pleasure. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I would hope that, uh, or I, I would have aspired to raise a daughter, um, who was, um, in touch with that, with her pleasure and, and realizing that the pursuit of it is, uh, is not only, a, 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 an independent right, uh, but something like uh, a celebration of the uh, you know evolutionary history of of her gender, right? This is how we got that way by females pursuing sexual pleasure, right? It's uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's astounding, and I and I think that uh, I hope my uh, uh, my uh, my daughter would be uh, 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 appreciate that lesson. You know, if you go to Sweden, like or Scandinavia, where it's much more, you know, it's con- Sweden's considered the most feminist country in the world and Swedish girls sleep with a lot more guys I mean it's insane if you ask the average Swedish girl in Sweden how many guys she slept with and she's let's say 22 it's at least like lots of girls are 30 to 50 in America it's like if it is that much, girls won't admit it. No, not well, many girls are going to be like fifty. One of the interesting things about those studies, Ty, is that it finds out that that uh, that people lie about how many people they've slept with. Yes, but they and, don't and lie they, about fifth. Girls don't lie about if the girl says fifty. No, no, she no, slept no, with fifty in America. I, if a girl says a, ten, she probably lied. I don't know the author right now, but yeah. there, there, there's a, there's a psychologist who took who took American undergrads and asked them you know, how many people they'd slept with, males and females. And then and then she does a control group where she straps them up to a fake lie detector uh, test. Oh, okay. Hmm. Right. And then asks them, ask them how many they slept with. Okay, in the regular experiment, guys have slept with many more than the women, right? right? And in the and in the and in the and the in the fake lie detector experiment where they where the coils are all there and it's really big and you know scary <laughs> looking. And it turns out that the differences are raced. Not only that, it turns out that women have now slept with more guys than the guys. Right. At least, and these are, okay, these are undergraduates, so maybe that's maybe true of undergraduate guys, right? Right. But the difference is a race, and they did it exactly in the way that the culture of the time would demand these people behave, right. that women should be coy and men should be successful, right? But right. how so, ugly, how ugly were these uh <laughs> Zach has a, qu- a very serious question. Yeah, I'm just, I'm curious to know. I mean, I, I imagine that would come into play. <laughs> I, 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 you know, it, it, their, their data to test exactly this idea, and it establishes, regardless of the actual numbers, it establishes that, um, that people lie. And people lie in ways that are conforming to what the culture kind of demands of them, right? So let me, t- I'm going to take some questions. I'm going to give 100 bucks away right now. We're going to PayPal. We're going to video this. <laughs> Adrian, and, okay, here we go, Sam. Did Sam die? Okay. Here's the hundred dollars. First person who answers this question, uh, based on the talk we've had here with Professor Prum or Rick. How, on average, on average, how much bigger is the average male human versus female human? How much bigger are men on average body weight, body size? There we go. Will plant 16% paying attention. 100 bucks sending it to you. By the way, stay to the end because I'm giving away this iPhone at the end uh, of my talk. I'll be doing a series of talks, so make sure you keep watching. Wow, I should do this in my Yale classes. Humans respond to rewards. Now, let's. I want to talk about beauty for a second in the sense because this is a you talked about the subjective nature of beauty. Like in Samoa, they like big women and big guys in in some of the tribes in Africa they've selected for big butts uh and you even see that in you know rap music it's people who are african-american or african descent their music is a little different than taylor swift in terms of the ideal woman if you watch the music music videos now i'm not stereotyping because there's obviously wide variety but that's a pretty freaking fair assessment rap talks more about big butts and you can trace this back to these tribes in Africa that selected for butt. 
it, are there universal standards of beauty though? Are there, you know, a certain ratio between your cheekbones and your your chin and things like this? Are there are big boobs, you know, universally more attractive uh, throughout history? Not looking at aberrations, but in general, what do you think on that subject? I, I think the answer is obviously no, and 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 one of the ways you know is that the human diversity is the result of uh, of 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 the history of human made choice, right? I mean, people that are around today uh, are here because somebody made it, right? And, right. Uh, Rise them, right? And 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 people look different around the world because not only because of uh, of natural selection, but because. Uh, of 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 ideas about beauty on different parts of the world, culture changed and culture influenced the, the uh, made choices. And so, um, you know, there are practically no standards of beauty that would apply across uh, across all uh, across all population of people. Now, having two eyes as opposed to one, or 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 or, or uh, you know, uh, you know, you, these you like this. Two-eyed or right? one-eyed women, Zach James. What are you? What's your preference? <laughs> but, but I mean, uh, but you know, uh, 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 other than that, uh, uh, the, the real criteria that people look. All you got to do is go to an art museum and you look at, you know, uh, uh, from Western culture, these uh, statues of Athena and Aphrodite, and 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 these were women so beautiful that they were considered worthy of worship, right? right. As goddesses, and these individuals today wouldn't turn anybody's head or make it through uh, a single uh, a, a casting call at a, at, a, at a Pepsi commercial, right? And so, um, you know, that's Western culture. There's nothing genetically distinct about those things. Culture changes. Ideas about beauty change. So do you think uh, if we went back in time and we took Brad Pitt and, and we put him in a you know, like swimsuit, or we dropped him off at any culture in the world, and we also had Danny DeVito, and we do we take him and we drop him off, or, or I don't know who's another not so attractive guy. Uh, I don't want to go on record saying names because they might listen to your podcast. Okay, so Danny DeVito, we drop him off. We dro- is there any culture where the women go, this Danny DeVito guy, <laughs> he is great looking, and this other dude is just disgusting. Wait, wait till they open their mouths. So you think personality could have a thing? I mean, DeVito is a, is a, <laughs> is a uh, how, why do you think he is a motor mouth and uh, such a such a, a moment by instant, right? Hysterically funny person. But do you right? think it could be? So going back to your thing, you're saying how if beauty is all that mattered in the cla- in the sense that we think of beauty, then lots of ugly people, quote unquote, ugly, have kids. But could that be because? That's all the man could get. You know, Chris uh, Chris Rock, the comedian, he says, and I don't know if you agree with this, he says, a man is only as faithful as his options. So one of the cla- things in classic evolutionary biology is that there is monogamy, but there's a straight line correlation. The more access a man get could get, whether it be through being more powerful, whether it be through having more money, they inevitably get women who are more beautiful in that culture like if you a good example would be billy joel married a supermodel what was his wife was it christy christy brinkley, christy brinkley. Yeah. if you look at billy joel he he wasn't so trapped but he attra- he got money right and and he had more options and he didn't settle for a girl that's not so attractive and so do you think men are only as fake because i mean your book kind of says I'm that it saying, says I'm that saying, women i'm gonna say, I'm gonna say i don't know uh, when Billy Joel or Billy uh, or, or whoever married uh, Christy Brinkley, uh, whether it was before or after the money, but but uh, after, that is, definitely <laughs> after. <laughs> yeah, that is okay. Uh, I think um, you know um, uh, money is is a new invention. You know, uh, we started evolving uh, independently from chimpanzees. You know, five to eight million years ago. Right, that's a long, long time. Money was invented after agriculture about 10,000 years ago. So, you know, that uh, has changed culture and changed uh, our behavior quite a bit. Um, You know, uh, and I think it has changed uh, uh, sexual culture. Uh, But, um, uh, you know, the 
the other thing to note is that these people are not that much happier than uh, than people with less money and right. fewer options, if you will. You know, I mean, that's why the newspapers are filled with or gossip columns are filled with like the screwed up lives of 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 rich, beautiful people. You know, that is not a path to like uh, any kind of success or fun in life. Right. Uh, you know, there's no it, it may seem fun in the moment, uh, but uh, it you know, it's 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 not it's not a recipe for happiness. Yeah. And so. um uh, I would think that in the long run, uh, you know, humans were built to be, we evolved to be satisfied, yeah. not to be like unsatisfied, profligate and unsatisfied. Right. And so, uh, uh, though that might be happening around now, but it's certainly not an admirable thing. Uh, I, I don't think. So you think that, do you, so you think that the best state for humans is a monogamous husband, wife, that is the I, best state for, that's I, our natural I, state now? I, I think we're built for happiness. Okay. And happiness doesn't last forever, right? Right. Or necessarily. Uh, but I think, you know, the thing that makes us different from the apes is this long childhood. And in, and in chimpanzees and gorillas, 100% of the parental care is done by females, right? Mm -hmm. Females are doing all of the, all of the, uh, uh, the caring, right? Uh, and one of the, and, and the, and not only the males, not, they don't, they don't interact with their children. They don't recognize them. They don't even identify as dads, right? right. The chimpanzee doesn't know who he's the dad of, right? And, and, and so, it's like so some people he, alive now, right? <laughs> that hasn't changed. But, but the human, but the human males are different, right? Not only do they identify with their kids, and, and experience pride or experience interest and experience, you know, joy in their, in their thriving, uh, they're involved in almost every culture of the world. Right. And, and that's, and that difference, how did the guy get to be like that? Right. He got to be like, because men who behave that way were attractive to females. Right. And not only that, if the male is participating, you know what, that kid does better, lives longer, uh, grows up with more food and blah, blah, you know, and so it does better. So, so yes, I think that uh, uh, parental investment by both sexes is important or was important. It wasn't permanent, and I don't think it's permanent necessarily in any part of the world or culture. But it was long enough so that the offspring actually could benefit. Right. Right. That means that means a lot of time, some time, and you know, and that's not. I don't think that's going to be surprising to anybody. Uh, to see that as some kind of an evolved state for for humans. Now, I'm not prescribing that that's the way people should be, but I think people are realizing that uh, um, that uh, you know using your telephone to hook up uh, at uh, at a high rate is not Tinder. a recipe. You're talking about happiness. Tinder, I'm assuming. You know, uh, yeah. males or females. Now, the fact is that you know I'm proposing that uh, that uh, that human evolution occurred because females made a lot of choices and those choices are not just mating choices they're remating choices you know right. right most of human sexuality is not about fertilization of eggs it's actually even in a, in a population without birth control it's about less than a quarter less 20 percent less than 20 percent of you know copulation uh, events are going to give right. rise to some kind of uh, uh uh you know fertilization right and so that's that means 80 percent of the time it's not about reproduction. It's about sampling. Right. And so so females have the chance to choose. Do I, did I like that? And do I like that again? That right. rechoice and rechoice requires at least some flexibility in sexuality. So it's not really about monogamy as we conceive of it, but choice and co-investment, co-co-investment. I think those are conditions that we can say are natural. And, and 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 what what makes that what makes that work is um, is um, really getting to know each other. You know, uh, most of the literature on uh, that uh, that uh, evolutionary psychologists do, they show people pictures and they ask you in in a, in a third of a second to evaluate. You know, how hot is this person, right? Um, but the fact is that that turns out to be a very poor indication of what we actually experience in life. The fact is. 
that interacting with somebody is like, wow, that person is an asshole or that person is really attractive. Why was it that I'm so interested in that person? Because we're more than just, you know, what we look like. We're personalities. And so that is an evolved part of, 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 of human sexuality, too. How much do uh, how much do I enjoy being with this person? That's not an accident. You know, uh, chimps go around. They don't really look like they enjoy being with each other. Uh, mostly. <laughs> Why is that? Because like Zach on a date. It's like some, uh, I, I've seen some couples that look <laughs> like they're chimps. <laughs> they but, look like they're chimps. They look like very, very unhappy people. Is that you? Let me, let me read something. I thought this was a great practical takeaway from the book. This is on iBooks. By the way, for those of you coming late, I'm with Professor uh, Prum here. The Evolution of Beauty is his book. He's a professor at Yale. On page 361 of iBooks, it says, uh, it's a Patricelli did an experiment. She used a robotic stuffed female vagina, which looked kind of like, or it was a female fake bird with a fake yeah, yeah. vagina. But okay, Patricelli was able to confirm her pi- hypothesis that female satin bower birds are communicating their comfort level to displaying males by crouching. You see that with chickens, like if a female likes it. But this is the interesting point. Number two. <laughs> Some males modulated their display intensity to put the females more at ease. And three, those, and this is the main takeaway that I, that I got from this chapter, those males who can regulate their display intensity to keep females more comfortable are ultimately the most successful at attracting mates. And I'll tell you, this subject of big guys, I have some big guys that I work out and do different martial arts, and I got some big guys that hang out with me. And... One of the most common things a woman will say, like Rome is six foot six, three hundred and twenty pounds, and women go, "I love him because he's like a he's like a cuddly teddy bear." So they don't actually they do like you know he's big, but they also like what you what this chapter talks about a man that can modulate and show that he's not just a tough guy and he can lower his voice and if you it's not always the traditional alpha male and you see, I still in nightclubs. It's not always the alpha that gets all the Justin Bieber's not an alpha, but he gets a few I mean he gets a lot of women. And and DiCaprio, when you look at some of these archetypes of what women like nowadays, and there is a lot of this. So I think men, we have to learn that you gotta be able to turn it on and turn it off a little bit. Your macho, your machismo. What what's interesting about Bowerbirds is, is that, you know, they live to be 20, 25 years old. So it, you know, they have uh, those older males have a lot of experience. Yeah. And 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 uh, that means experience being either good or bad at, you know, attracting attracting mates. Um, so a lot of that what makes that that plausible is the males that moderate their their display behavior have ex, have more experience. They're older tend to be, at least in the bowerbirds. Uh, and what that means is that, you know, um, they're socially complicated. Right. Uh, the guy that just rushes in. Uh, and does all these wild displays and freaks out the female uh, is, you know, just uh, awkward and, uh, and, 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 and distracting, right. right? And so, and, you know, he either learns or changes or he doesn't and is unsuccessful, right? So those males that are successful are the ones that are socially attentive. Yeah. Uh, and, and, that, and that speaks also to the fact that, you know, we're not the only species to think that personality is important. Because right. how are these how are these bowerbirds varying? The males different vary. They vary in personality. They vary in you know how sensitive they are to the responses of the other individuals. Some of them are just brash, uh, and and some of them are are are, are extremely tuned in, uh, and um, and it matters to females, right? Yeah. Well, good. I know we went over time. You were gracious enough to stay a Thank little you. longer. Let, I just want to give a shout out to your book because it, it is an interesting book i've read it one and a half times daniel lieberman is and jared diamond recommends jared diamond's pulitzer prize winner daniel lieberman wrote one of my favorite books the story of the human body he's a harvard guy all recommend so go out and grab the evolution of beauty by richard prum how da- darwin's forgotten theory of mate choice shapes the animal world iBooks. it's on there i got it i get them on I get books on iBooks all the time because it's so easy to take notes and they store forever. So sometimes I lose books. I have probably 10,000 books I own. So today we couldn't find the evolution of beauty, but I had it on my phone um, and, and it was a powerful thing. 
I'm glad you found a copy to hold up so you didn't have to hold up your phone. Yeah, hold on my phone. Well, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate your interest in the book. Awesome. Thanks so much. So I'm going to be back. I'm going to take a little break, and we're going to be giving away on a new live stream, the iPhone 7. We gave away some money. Thanks so much, and uh, talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Take care. Goodbye. Bye. Here, you want to end these? Same. Great, guys. Thanks. I'll talk to you soon.